Take your Bible and uh, let's, let's open it back up. Let me finish where I left off last night on the instruction manual. All right? Let's find out a little bit about our Bible, how to read it, how to know it, how to understand it. How the Bible, when Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, when you have the Bible, he really has never left you. He will never forsake you. And you can, in life, have a constant companion with you. And that is the companion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go to Hosea and Romans. In fact, if you wanted to just kind of go to Hebrews, because we're going to be there for a little bit. Uh, but we're just kind of learning. When we read our Bibles, what is, it, what is it saying? How is it speaking to us? And so last night we learned, number one, to read it. You've got to read it. Um, number two, believe it. Amen? Number three. What was number three? Huh? Meditate on it. Think on these things. Number four. Search it. Okay? Read a little bit here, read a little bit there. Number five. Read around it. Walk circumspectly. Don't just, somebody gives you a little verse and say, that's, that's how you're supposed to believe. Open your Bible up and read what came before that. What's called context. Okay? The context of what was being said, who it was being said to, what came before it, what comes after it. Does it match the rest of the scripture? Or is what they're trying to tell you, does it contradict the scripture? Because remember, Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. Cannot be broken. Once God says it, it's that way. Amen? And it stays that way because God doesn't change. What else? Compare it. We compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Uh, we've done a little bit of that this morning. We saw that 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2 Peter 3, they say the same thing. Mm -hmm. They talk about the day of the Lord, talk about it as a thief in the night. So those two are comparable. They are companion verses. They're mated together. I like to see things in the New Testament. I like to see them in the Old Testament. I like to get that double witness. All right? So we're comparing it, and then what? Numbering. Numbering it. Count things. God uses numbers as symbols, and He defines. God alone defines the numbers. He defines the symbols. He defines those things. Then we had double it. God speaketh once, yea, twice. There's always going to be a second witness. There are going to be prophecies that have not been completely fulfilled yet. The book of Joel, quoted in the book of Acts, and yet the sun was not darkened, the moon didn't turn. That's going to be August 21st here. <laughs> Amen. You ought to come back for the, uh, for the eclipse. This is going to be cool. And there ain't a hotel within 100 miles of this place that's available. So you have to sleep out in the parking lot, all right? But it's going to be neat. My wife bought us special glasses to stare at the sun with. For some reason, mine don't have lenses in it. I don't know what that means, but anyway. So double it. Now, foreshadow it. Foreshadow it. If you study literature, there is an element in literature when people write stories. They'll use what's called foreshadowing. Okay? They will, at the beginning of the story, give you a picture of how the story ends. And if you don't know it's there, you read it and you don't really pay attention because you don't know how the story ends. But when you get to the end of the story, you'll go, wait a minute, that was written in, back in chapter 2. The Bible. God invented foreshadowing. And he put it all in his scriptures. Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. I have also spoken by the prophets. So, and he speaks plainly by those prophets. I have also spoken by the prophets. I have multiplied visions. That's like doubling it. I've multiplied the visions and used similitudes. 
by the ministry of the prophets. Um, when the prophet Hosea, when God called upon him to marry a harlot, her name was Gomer. Not only did he marry her out of obedience, he ended up loving her. And he thought that by marrying her and giving her a new life that she wouldn't be a harlot anymore. But she was. And she left him. And Hosea was heartbroken. So what did he do? He went out and found her. And paid the price to buy her back. Brought her back into his house. And now she's a different woman. That's a similitude. That's Israel. That may even be some of you. Where God called you once. And you came in. But then later in life. You walked back out. Went out. Messed with the world. Got involved in things you should have never got involved in. And yet God did not give up on you. God loved you and he brought you back in. And now you're different. You've heard my testimony. When I grew up in this church, it was King James Bible. And then I went to Bible college. Okay? And I walked away from that. And I wandered out in the wilderness. But God loved me. And he called me back in. And now it's... King James Bible. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Similitudes. Romans 5.14 Nevertheless, Adam, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. In all of the sins that you've ever committed, not one of them had to do with eating fruit. <laughs> Think about it. But you did a lot of other things. So Adam's transgression was a similitude. And if you think about it, you know, you and I are guilty of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Well, that's what Eve encountered there in the garden. She had the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And she fell into that sin and Adam sinned after her. And even though we have not sinned the exact same sin Adam sinned, the Bible says, who is the figure of him that was to come. Romans 5, if you want to understand how typology works, foreshadowing, Romans 5 is it. Because it talks about, Adam did this, therefore Christ does this. For as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so by one man life everlasting. And you'll see that contrast. You'll see the foreshadowing of Adam, the similitude of Adam, and then you'll see the fulfillment in Christ. I mean, think about this. The bride of Christ comes forth from Christ from a wound in his side. God formed the wife from a wound in Adam's side and then brought her to him. And one of these days, God is going to bring us to Jesus Christ. You have a similitude there. Uh, Luke chapter 17. Just very quickly. As it was in the days of Noah... The Bible's telling you that the story of Noah is a similitude. It is a foreshadowing. It is a type, a, a figuring of how the second coming is going to be, what it's going to look like. And you have the, you have the symbols, you have the pictures of the ark. Study the ark. Study the animals that went into the ark. Why were there some of them? Why were the clean animals brought in by sevens? Why the unclean animals were brought in by twos. If you'll learn those numbers, at some point it'll click in your head. I know why there was seven clean. I know why there was two unclean. They represent something. The timing of those days. Why was it 40 days and 40 nights? Why was it 150 days? Why was it on the 17th day of the second month? The 17th day of the seventh month? All of those things play into that. And the more you study the Bible, the more these types just start appearing in your mind. Luke 17, 28, as it was in the days of Lot, there's another foreshadowing. God saved Lot from the wrath that he literally poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. And 
How many, let's see, there was Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam. How many cities? Four. There's a kingdom coming. The fourth kingdom. And that's what those four cities represent. See how the number makes it make sense? Okay? That's why the numbers are important. Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And by the way, this is where that belief thing comes in, Kevin. Because if you don't believe that a whale swallowed up Jonah and he lived in there three days and swam in vomit, if you don't believe that, then what Jesus said doesn't make any sense to you. You got to believe the Bible in its history so you can believe the Bible in its prophecy. Okay? Luke 11:30 For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites. That's typology, that's symbolism, that's the picture, the similitude. Colossians chapter 2, turn there. Colossians 2. Verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. I love the Ten Commandments. I think they ought to restore the Ten Commandments in all of our school buildings. Amen. I think every judge ought to have a copy of the Ten Commandments. Amen. Number one, sitting right in front of their judgment seat, but number two, right there where they can read it. I think judges ought to believe in God. Amen? Amen. Okay? But those Ten Commandments are against us. We can't do them. Try as you might. You can't do it. And so we're condemned by it. So Christ blotted them out and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers. What are those? Devils, spirits, principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness, night places. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Let no man judge you. And if you've never had that experience, just sign up for Facebook. <laughs> and you will have people judging you. You post a picture of your puppy and somebody's going to come unglued about it. Okay? That's just how people are. People love to hide behind their computer screen and say things that they wouldn't normally say to your face. Okay? But they'll do it. And they're going to judge everything that you do. And you say, oh, they're good friends of mine. They're on Facebook and this and that and the other. And all you got to do is say, well, I went to church Sunday. What are you doing going to church on Sunday? That's the mark of the beast. I mean, they'll come out of their skin on you, judging you about the things that you do, neglecting the things that they do. These same people never come out on Facebook and say, I'm an idiot. I broke the Sabbath. You ought to hate my guts. They never do that. Anyway, principalities and powers triumphing over them, triumphing in it. Let men therefore judge you in meat or drink, respect of any holy day or of any, the new moon and Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. Every Sabbath day since the creation has been a foreshadowing of the 1,000 year reign of Christ. That day truly is the day of the Lord. He is going to have his way on his day and nobody's going to deny him that amen? amen so those things are a shadow of the real that's what hebrews teaches you the old testament law the animal sacrifices the priests the tabernacle the ark of the covenant the table all of those things were a shadow of better things they're not the real Thing. They are only the shadow of it. They are a shadow of things to come. The body is Christ. Hebrews chapter 8. Turn there. Um, again, if you want to study typology, study Hebrews. Hebrews is loaded. Hebrews tells you all about the stories and the things in the Old Testament being foreshadows of things to come. 
Uh, Hebrews 8, verse 3, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example. There's a key word there. So if you are going to uh, further study this, Make a list of words to look at. Example is one of them. Similitude is another. Shadow is one. Okay? Shadow, example and shadow of heavenly things. In fact, right there, the Bible is defining both of those words for you. In the context of studying typology. A shadow is an example. An example is a shadow. Years ago... When I preached, I used to try to think of clever examples to give people. And I found that it's a lot easier to just use the examples that are already in the Bible to explain it. Because number one, God himself wrote it. That way it can't be wrong. And so it's just better, easier for me to stick with the Bible and its examples. Okay? The example and shout of heavenly things as, see that word as? There's another word to study. So write that down on your list. Type in the word as and look at all 58,000 kajillion occurrences of the word as, as in the Bible, okay? Uh, pack a lunch because you're going to need it, all right? But that word as, as it was in the days of Noah, as Jonas did this, as this is that. So as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. God was very particular. Moses, when you make that ark, make it exactly the way I showed you mine looks like. When you build the tabernacle, do it exactly the way that I showed you how it is. So that... Moses' tabernacle truly is a proper representative of God's tabernacle in heaven. And as these priests are doing all these things here in the tabernacle on earth, that is a shadow of the angelic priest of the order of Melchizedek. It is a shadow of how they do things. Right down to the transportation of the Ark of the Covenant. It was to be done by four Levite priests. They were Four of those priests were to take that ark, the staves running through the rings, they were to pick that up and bear that on their shoulders. What was, what was David? How did David move the ark? Does anybody know? On a cart. Drawn by two oxen. And Uzzah paid the price for it. It wasn't right. It wasn't God's way. And there are some who are going around saying, well, God doesn't care how we do it just as long as we do it. That's no. The how means something. Those four Levite priests were a shadow of the four living creatures that held the firmament that suspended the throne of God. When God moved... He was on those four angels. And the shadow was the four Levite priests. So can Moses use three or six Levite priests to carry it? Or two? It's got to be four. How many Gospels? Got to be four. Amen? The way is by what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? I love picking on you guys. Okay. Anyway, it's the shadow. Hebrews 10. Turn there. I would love to just spend the rest of the afternoon in Hebrews 10. I love Hebrews 10. Beautiful, beautiful chapter. Do you believe that they're going to try to build a temple in Jerusalem? I think, I think they might. But I don't think Jesus is going to live in it. Amen. 
We're the temple. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. Okay? He's not going to do it. The Jews are going to say, hey, we need to build a temple for the Messiah. He's, the Messiah is going, no thanks. Okay? I'll build my own. And that's what you see. Uh, that's what you see in the scriptures. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. And that, I had a conversation with that gentleman yesterday and he tried to tell me, tried to sell me on the idea that everybody in the Old Testament was saved by the law in the Old Testament. Show me that verse. Show me that. It's not there. It says right here that the law, the shadow, cannot make anybody perfect. Law can't. It's a shadow. I mean, think about your hand and the shadow of your hand. Which gets more done in the run of a day? Your hand, not your shadow. Amen? And that's what he's telling you here. Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sin. What he's saying is, if the Old Testament law and sacrifice saved those people, why did they keep offering the sacrifices? Why not, once a person is cleansed by the blood of a lamb or a goat... Why did they have to go back the next year and have their sins forgiven all over again? Why does the Catholic priest have to say another Mass and re-crucify the Son of God afresh? Why did they do that? It's because they think that your sins must be atoned for and sacrificed for every time you do them. And if you get saved one day or get your sins forgiven one day and you go out and sin the next day, you've got to say another Mass. You've got to kill Jesus all over again. That's not. That's an abomination. One time. And with God, one time is good enough. Amen. Amen. How many times did you get saved? Amen. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not, you underline this verse. And when anybody tries to tell you that people in the Old Testament were saved by the law. It says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Amen. So then in verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And if it was good enough for Jesus, amen, it's good enough for me. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. This typology, this is learning types and shadows. Seeing how God works in the stories that are written in the Bible. This Bible is not just a book of, this is the doctrine, this is what I'm saying, now believe it and do it. God then, as a great teacher would do, He explains it. He gives you the sense and the meaning of it, so you can understand it. He uses things that we are common to see. 1 Corinthians 15, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, where a seed goes into the ground. And that shell on that seed must rot off because of the scent of water in the ground making it rot off so that what's inside of that shell can spring forth and what comes out of that seed does not look like the seed that went in there. It looks amazing. Amen? And that's our loved ones that have gone on before us, that we have had to commit their body to the ground. We weren't burying them. We were planting them. Amen? In the beautiful garden of God. So they, and all of that is typology. 
It's similitude. A seed is a similitude. Baptism. Water baptism is a similitude. An outward showing of what God has done on the inside. Amen? Amen. It is the visible of the invisible. I can't see what God has done on the inside of you except you be baptized. Then I know you're identifying yourself with Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat of the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Was the rock real? It was a real rock, wasn't it? And real water came out of a real walk. Walk. <laughs> oh, your fried rice is bloody. Okay. Um, <laughs> a real rock gave them real water. So the word spiritual does not mean in your mind only, think nice thoughts. It's, in fact, the spirit is more real than this flesh that it's living in. Okay? Think about that. That rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were written, were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. How does God deal with disobedient people? Chastises them? That's his, that's his children. How does God deal with people who are not his children who are disobedient? They fall. They fell in the wilderness. Why is it that ten spies come back and say, we can't go in there? How did God deal with those ten spies? Anybody know? They were all killed. God killed all ten of them. The only two let live was Joshua and Caleb. They had a different spirit in them. A spirit of belief. Amen. And so all of Israel, their carcasses rotted in the wilderness. Why? Unbelief. They maybe believed a little bit when they left Egypt. But they stopped believing. And they said, we're not going. Let's make us a captain. Let's go back to Egypt. And God said, fine. You're not going. Because of unbelief. Okay? And I'm, I'm staunch on that issue. You either believe or you don't. You either finish the course and abide in faith. Or you fall in the wilderness. Okay? That's your example. And then verse, verse 11. Now all these things happen to them for in samples. Here's another word. So you have uh, shadow. You have similitude. You have example. You have in sample. All these things happen to them for in samples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Those stories are written for us and for our learning. They made the mistakes. Let's not make the same mistake they made. Amen? Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah. There's that word as again. So the Bible is telling you, go read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't just think it. Go back and read it. And then a couple months later, go read it again because there's something you missed. And then the next week, go read it again because there's something else you missed. And you can read Genesis every month for the rest of your life and find something brand new in it every time you read. Amen. That's just how deep this Bible is. Amen. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. God pouring out His wrath upon those cities. And yet... Saving who the Bible calls Lot a just man. Lot was a sinner. Lot ended up 
pitching his tent towards Sodom. And then the next time you see him, he's in the gates of Sodom. He's on the city council. He's a town man. Right? He should have never been there. And he paid the price for it, didn't he? Lost his wife. Lost his, the, the husbands, the future husbands of his two daughters. Lost everything that he had. But God called him just. You know why? God justified him. God forgave all of his sins and saved him. So, I mean, that right there is telling you. Who does God save? Those whom he forgives and those whom he justifies. Amen. 2 Peter 2, 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. That means clean up your life. Amen. Quit listening to Willie Nelson. <laughs> Brad Paisley and... I don't know who else. Man, who else is that? I don't know. I don't listen to it anymore. I don't know. Lady Gaga. Don't listen. <laughs> Sterling, get rid of your Lady Gaga CDs. <laughs> Galatians 4. He's talking about Sarah and Hagar. And he says, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. How much more plain does it get than to say that the Old Testament and keeping the law is bondage? Why? Because you'll never do it. You will try and try and try and try and you'll never accomplish it. It's better to be free from the law of sin and death. Hebrews 9, verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying. Here's another word to your list. Signify or sign. The word sign is in the word signify. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. What were those swaddling clothes? Job tells us that it was the clouds of the earth. The clouds being the swaddling band of the earth. So even Jesus at his first coming was showing forth his second coming. Because he's coming in the clouds. Amen. Amen. When he comes in the clouds, we're going to go. Here we go. Let's go. Amen. So he's telling you these things. Signs and signify. Um, what was it God used in Genesis 9? A token. He said, the token of my covenant, when I bring the cloud over the land, you shall see the bow that's in the cloud. That's my token. It's a sign. That's foreshadowing. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure. There's another word. Figure. For the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Again, we find that the law is insufficient. The speed limit signs on the highways do not stop people from breaking the speed limit. Amen. It doesn't stop them. It just tells them there's a penalty. There is a limit, there is a rule, and there must be a penalty. All right, last verse, 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the longsuffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure. There it is. Noah was a figure. Was Noah real? Not the Russell Crowe Noah. The Bible Noah. Noah was real. That ark was real. Those animals were real. That water was real. 
And it really covered every mountain on the earth. Okay? Everything in this world covered by water. Okay? If you don't believe it's real, you're not going to understand typology. You're not going to understand prophecy. The light figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Right? Water baptism saves us? All right. It's just like shaking hands with my shadow. It's going to feel awfully limp to you. Okay? You can't shake hands with my shadow. Okay? The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. And I kept trying to convince this man on the phone yesterday. Water only cleanses the flesh. Not the soul. And he couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. But the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, the idea is, you study the Bible, you read the Bible, you believe the Bible, meditate on the Bible, double the Bible, number the Bible. What else do we have? Compare the Bible, and then shadow the Bible. Okay? Bible typology will help you understand things that you never understood before. It'll show you things. There's stories, there's patterns, there's types, there's all kinds of things in the Bible. And if I run into something I'm having trouble to understand, I ask God, God, show me a picture of that. Show me what that looks like in the Bible. All right? Now, let's go back to the day of the Lord. All right? The day of the Lord. Let's take our Bibles and go to... 1 Samuel 4. Actually, I skipped ahead too much. Isaiah 13. We can start there. Isaiah 13, 6. How ye? For the day of the Lord is at hand. Right? Meaning, number one, it's within reach. When something is at hand... It means they can, they can get it easily. It's right there, right present with them. So that's the simple meaning of it. Um, I think there is also a symbolic idea with the hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. There's a number here. Okay, you have five fingers, right? Okay. Um, Josh, how many bones in your hand? 27. It's the number of books in the New Testament. Okay, so when you lay hands on someone, okay, when uh, Jacob crossed his hands and laid them on Manasseh and Ephraim, he is bestowing upon them in a type and a shadow the blessing of the new covenant, not the law, grace, okay, because he blessed these boys before they were old enough to really do anything, and Joseph brought the firstborn to Jacob's right hand. Jacob, by act of the Holy Ghost, crossed his hands like this and put his right hand upon Ephraim, not Manasseh. Then Manasseh. And it's showing you something. All right? So the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. There's that destruction again, the destroyer. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pains and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. Now again, that, Isaiah 13, matches what we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, doesn't it? They both mention the day of the Lord, and they both are joined together by the travailing of a woman who's about ready to give birth. Sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flame. Hindus having put on their foreheads an emblem of a flame because they believe that Shiva, their God, has given them Illumination and has given them the flame of divinity. The day of the Lord is coming and it's going to be a fiery trial. 
men, literally, hell brought up to earth. Is that possible? Yeah. Revelation 6. Death and hell follow with him. So their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath. So we know God's going to pour out his wrath and fierce anger. And to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. So Christ then initiates his day. A process takes place where the sinners are destroyed. So that when Christ is ready to reign, everybody who stands in resistance to him is gone. What a world this is going to be. Amen. Amen. And no taxes. <laughs> huh? <coughs> yeah. You sure did. Amen. So anyway, but that day is coming. God's going to pour out his wrath on that day. Pains and sorrows are going to take hold of people. 1 Thessalonians 5, that's what we found. We read that as travail upon a woman with a child and they shall not escape. Now very quickly, I know we've touched on this passage before, but very quickly. Notice that from verse 5 all the way down, verse 5, 6, 7, 8, deal with two types of people. And they're identified as children. Group A, children of the day. Group B, children of darkness. The lamp that is in them, their candle, has been blown out. The light that God tried to use to illuminate them, now they live in utter darkness. The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of darkness, people. Amen? There's no light. You know why? They got rid of all the Bibles. They got rid of the right Bibles. So now there's no light. There's only darkness. Um, turn to Isaiah 29. Let's spend a little time there. We mentioned earlier that at the day of the Lord, people are going to go and hide themselves. And we saw that that was related to Revelation chapter 6. And in Revelation chapter 6, there is the opening of a book that has seals on it. So in Isaiah 29, verse 9, that's what you have. Stay yourselves in wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. Remember the children of darkness? The children of darkness are drunken because they're in the darkness. Who in here used to go to taverns, bars, pubs? Okay? Very well lit, aren't they? <laughs> They're all dark, aren't they? You ever wonder why that was? Because drunks love darkness. There's something about light that drunk people don't like. Turn that off! Ah! <laughs> but if you're sober, you don't mind daylight. You don't mind being in the light, amen? You ever notice these new churches? They took all the lights out of the congregation. Amen. You think that's a big deal? I do. I think, number one, you can read your Bible better if you've got a light over your head. And for some reason, these churches just don't mind it if people don't read their Bible. But number two, they want all the light on whosoever's on the stage. They get all the light. And so what happens is you, the congregation, are drawn to them instead of to the light that you should be drawn to. I just don't like churches that take all the lights out. I had a pastor out in uh, Fayetteville, a friend of mine, uh, Springdale, actually. And I was teaching on this out there, and he came to me, and he said, Mike, he said, I got a youth pastor. He's a good guy. He said, but I can tell he's got some of that stuff in him. And what he wants to do is get all the young people out of the main worship service and take them out to the family center that we have and turn all the lights out and have them have a church service in there. And he said, I just something about it don't sound right. And he said, now I see it. 
And he said, as far as I'm concerned, if they're going to have church, they're going to have the lights on. Okay? I'm just saying to you, it's, it's in people's nature that they don't. Lost people don't spend all day reading the Bible. You know why? They don't like the light. They stay away from it. So, back here, this sealed book, these people are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. That means they have a spirit in them. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. It's a spirit. And hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. And what he's saying here, I think the 21st equivalent of that is, we have pulpits now in this nation that are full of darkness. And God is taking these men deliberately, and he has closed their eyes. And they look right at the Bible, and they can't see it. They don't understand it. To them, it doesn't make any sense. Or they say things like this. And I, I had a guy that uh, he was like a youth, a volunteer youth minister at his church. And the pastor brought in one of these hot shot youth speakers, you know. And the guy did his deal on the stage for about 40 minutes. And the youth pastor noticed that the guy never quoted the Bible. Never opened it up. Never said, everyone take your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 4. N never did anything like that. So he went to him, John, and he questioned him after the service. He said, why did you not use scripture? Well, young people today, they wouldn't understand it. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't get it if I just read scripture. So I have found that if I speak to them on their level and say things the way they like to hear it, then I can reach them then. Yeah, but what are you reaching them for? What are you planting in them if you're not planting the incorruptible seed of the Word of God? Okay? And that is prevalent now. In a lot of places, a lot of churches, you find a lack of Scripture. And it's because God, for these guys, has just closed their eyes. That's a shame. God could have done that and should have done that with me. God should have done that with you. He should have just sealed that book, closed your eyes, and said, you're on your own. Aren't you glad he didn't? Amen. So the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. The vision of all is becoming to you as the words of a book that is sealed. Which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot. For it is sealed. The book is delivered into him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. And what we have, way too many churches and way too many pulpits, where the word is not understood, it's not even read. Because God closed it up and poured out a spirit of slumber and deep sleep upon these preachers, upon these churches, denominations, big ministries, you name it. They read the Bible, they don't get it. They don't understand it. So they come up with their own thing. And that's what they're teaching, that's what they're promoting. Now let's turn to 1 Samuel. We have women. They're going to have a baby. Anybody here getting hungry? That was my son. JR, take him down to the gas station. Get him one of them burritos that's been sitting out on the shelf for hours. Get him one of those. First Samuel 4. You have a baby that's going to be born. You have a child. You have a woman that's travailing. So we have in 1 Samuel 4, the setup is the Ark of the Covenant has been taken. God's throne, God's mercy, God's covenant, that's what's in the Ark of the Covenant. The blood, the applied blood. 
the sprinkled blood, the book, the covenant, the Aaron's rod that budded, the manna, God, God feeding his people, God making a covenant with his people, God forgiving his people, God ruling over his people. That's been taken away from the Jews. That's from Israel. They lost it. It's gone. Okay? And the heathen now have it. The, the Philistines. So here's what happens. When Eli hears about it, when he hears that the ark has been taken, he fell off his seat backward. There's a falling that took place. Okay? He fell backward. And he died. And then, what happens after that? Verse 19, his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife. Remember Hophni and Phineas? Wonderful men, weren't they? No, they were wicked adulterous men disobedient his daughter-in-law Phineas wife was with child near to be delivered and when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead she bowed herself and travailed for her pains came upon her now you're seeing a, a type a shadow an example okay you're seeing a foreshadowing of the day of the Lord coming the child that's born Let's pay attention to that child. Because two, one of two things is going to happen. The righteous are going to be exalted and glorified. And the wicked are going to be destroyed. Two children born. In this case, it's the man of sin, the son of perdition. Because his name is Ichabod. The glory has departed. That's who that Antichrist is. He is Ichabod. He represent, when he shows up on the scene, he represents the glory of God has now departed. And God has left me in charge. And then you have Revelation 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. She being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. What child was she going to give birth to? The one who was going to rule all nations with the rod of iron. Christ himself. Amen? And the dragon is standing before the woman to devour the child as soon as he's born. But when he's born, he's caught up. I like that phrase, don't you? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. I think they match. I think they match. I think they're mated together. John chapter 16. A woman, verse 21, when she is in travail has sorrow. And here's something. This was the last Watchman broadcast I did. It's called Great Tribulation. And I know it's not popular. I know I have friends that probably disagree with it. But I think that before we appear in the air with Christ, I believe travail comes. A time of sorrow. A time of trial. A time of tribulation. See, God appointed us to wrath. Who are, excuse me, I said that wrong. Boy, slap my mouth. God has not appointed us to wrath. But he says nothing about us not going through any tribulation. In fact, we're appointed to it. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God okay again it's not popular and I'm not saying seven years I'm not saying three and a half years I don't know how long it lasts but I think Satan is going to try to sift us as we and you know what let him because all he's going to accomplish is rubbing off this chaff away from us which is burn up in the heat. And the wheat is stored in the garner of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He's going to gather us together just like those servants are going to go out and gather the tares first and then the wheat. So a woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Now, let's do one more thing. Let's go back to this very quickly. I'm going to finish this out, and then we'll go eat. Who wants some good pig? Say amen. <laughs> Amen. So, the Word of God. We read it, believe it, meditate on it, double it, number it, <laughs> circumspect it, okay? compare it, foreshadow it. Now here's a number it. Here's the last thing. You ready? Wait for it. Who's better at working in your life? You or God? God is. Sarah's getting, Sarah, right? Okay, she's getting married in December. Okay. Who gave that man? God did. Okay. And it's better if God does it. And if we try to go out and do it ourselves. How many of us know that? Say amen. Because we all tried it, right? Yeah. We tried to do what we wanted and failed at it. Okay? And it's just better. I'm just one of these guys that while some preachers try to make this Bible be a self-help thing, I just think it's God help. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen to them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the promise. Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And those who have ever had the experience of a Pentecostal or charismatic service where when you went to the altar, they surrounded you and tried different things to get you to speak in tongues. Who has ever had an experience like that? Sure. Wow. And yet on the day of Pentecost, they tried nothing. And every one of them spoke with unknown tongues. Yeah. It's just exactly the way Jesus said it was going to happen. If you'll go and then wait, I'll bring it to pass. God does not tell us to go and take over the world for him so he can reign. He's going to do it himself. He does not tell us to build him a house. He's going to build his own house. Okay? And I'm just one of these that if you feel that maybe God is calling you to the ministry or God is calling you to a particular thing, I'm just one of these that says it's better to wait on God and let God do it. Okay? Uh, Psalm 25.3, Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. When you read this Bible and you say, boy, I mean, that's good. I want that. God, can I have that in my life? God may say to you, yes. In time. In time. But if you wait on... See, all of us who have tried to do God's will on our own, we ended up looking stupid. And we ended up being ashamed. Because it didn't turn out right. Made big boasts and big promises. Okay? There was a preacher that came to this town, took a church, and he started promoting himself in this church because he was going to turn this church into the next mega church. He was going to be the next Rick Warren. 
even to the extent that the local paper did, a, did an article on him. I guess he arranged that somehow and about how he was going to take this church and how he was going to make big uh, inroads in the community and how they was going to just change this community for the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, just boasted all the time about what he was going to do. He ended up having about six or seven affairs in that church. It was just going from one woman to another in that place. And the church finally caught up with him and run him out to get out. It's just better to wait on the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 25, 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Amen. Psalm 25, 21. Let integrity <clears throat> and uprightness preserve me for I wait on thee. Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage for he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. He tells you to wait. If God's got something good in the Bible, and you're reading it, and you say, oh, man, it's awesome. If it's worth having, it's worth waiting for. Amen? Psalm 37, 7, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of Him who prospereth in His way. I used to look at big churches and covet that. I want a big church. I want a church that's got a billion dollar budget. I want that big building. I want that nice office. And I want this. And I want a thousand people coming. Every, I want this. I used to lust after that. And then think that I had to go and perform in order to get it. I used to drive myself nuts every Sunday morning, fretting over how good I was going to do on the Sunday sermon delivery. And how many people I could get to come to the altar. I used to, that used to eat me up. And God finally settled me. Mike, just preach the word. And don't worry about who comes down to the altar that Sunday. Because it may be five days from now, they'll remember something that I spoke to them. And I will bring a change in their life. Because I've been in church all my life. And I've seen people run to the altar, hang around for a few weeks, and out they go. And they're never coming back. I've seen it, and I've seen it over and over and over again. And altar calls with a bunch of people on the altar just don't impress me the way they used to. I would much rather see you hanging around here 10, 15, 20 years from now than to see you a flash fire in a grease pan and then out the door and never see you again. Okay? Psalm 37, 9, Evildoers shall be cut off. Those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Psalm 69, 6, Let, them, let not them that wait on thee, O Lord of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. And you know, there's one verse in particular. Isaiah 40, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Oh, stop right here for a minute. Does it really mean that we're going to get wings? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. We're going to be as the angels. Right? We shall be as the angels in heaven. The Bible says. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, in this body, I don't have wings. And I run and get weary. And I faint. When I get my new body, I won't faint. I'll run and not be weary. Amen? Are you waiting on it? Wait on that new body. Wait on it. It'll come. Amen? Lamentations 3, the Lord is good unto them that wait for Him. To the soul that seeketh Him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. That involves you praying for lost family members and waiting on God to save them. I tried that with my brother-in-law. He got in jail. 
and told me he prayed when he was in jail. And as soon as he got out of jail, I started working on him. I'm going to get him in church. And I'm going to have him reading the Bible. And I'm going to have him forsaken all of the things that he did in life. And I worked hard with him. And after a while, I saw that the baggage of his sin and his past was still hanging on him heavy. And no matter what I did, I was not going to make a change in his life. And pretty soon, he quit coming to church. I tried to talk to him about the Lord a little bit. Wasn't reading his Bible. Wasn't interested in listening to me. And I, find, I was just forced to just take my hands off of him. See, I tried to push him into the cross. He wouldn't have it. And I prayed. And I prayed. And I prayed. Until finally, God worked in his life. God brought him and sat him down next to his mom. And he'd be sitting there where Spencer is with a Bible, King James Bible in his hand. You see, he not only got saved, he got King James Bible saved. Okay? And he'd sit there and I'd be preaching and I'd see him say, Amen. Shaking his head. And I'm going, he never done that before. And that little tiny room up there that I sit in day in and day out where I do Pastor Mike online. I do a lot of my study up there. He walked out of here one Sunday and he said, Is there, if there's anything around here I can do, he said, I just want to do something for God. I said, I'll keep that in mind. And I woke up one morning and I just had that room in mind. And so I called him. I said, Stevie, I got something for you. Come on over here. And I told him, showed him what I wanted. And I said, can you build that for me? And he said, yeah. He said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I have no idea. So he built it. And it sat there for a while. And then I figured, I bet I can do live broadcast out of here. Okay? And I started doing that. And most of what you see out of me in a week comes out of that room. And not too long after he built that, he came in on a Sunday morning. Came into my office and he said, Hoggard, he said, um, I want to talk to you for a minute. He said, how, how will I know for sure that I'm going to heaven? And I just sat back and I smiled and I looked at him and I said, you are. I said, I can see it all over you. I said, I see a difference in you that I've never seen before. So I prayed with him there. He didn't get saved right there, but he was already saved. And I saw it in him. And that Friday... He got on that chariot and rode home to glory. And his son told me, he said, Dad was different. I'd walk in here to the trailer and Dad'd be sitting there reading his Bible. Dad was trying to show me verses out of the Bible that I needed to know. That man was saved. And see, what happened was God made me wait on his salvation. And you know what? God was not late in saving him. He saved him at the exact right time the way he wanted to do it. And he wanted to do one thing for God. And though he being dead, yet speaketh. God is still using that room to be glorified out of this church house. From an old, wicked, hell-deserving sinner that I waited for God to save who in here has got friends and loved ones you would love to see saved? Let God save you. In fact, stay out of His way. And let God save you. What's going on, big guy? You came here just in time for lunch, didn't you? <laughs> Love you, man. That's Craig from Shell Knob, buddy. Okay? That's no one of them wicked, hell deserving sinners saved by the grace of God. Amen. 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 Let's let's do this. Love you, buddy. Let's do this. Let's let's bow our heads. Okay? And we're gonna we're gonna pray over the meal, but I want you to think now, those loved ones. I want you to think of your sons and your daughters that are lost. And your grandchildren. I want you to think of some uncles and aunts that are lost. 
They're good people, but they're lost. And then just tell God that you'll be patient with Him while God works the work in them that He worked in you. You didn't, you didn't get all saved up in one day. God had to work it in you. It came in season. And it was worth waiting for. We are saved by hope. Don't lose hope with God. He can still save them. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. This book's powerful. This book is right. And God, we act so foolishly sometimes. We try to step in, take over. We try, God, to make things happen. We try to produce fruit. And all we do is end up embarrassing ourselves. God, when are we going to learn that what you do in us and for us and through us is far better than what we do ourselves? God, you've taught me over and over about even ministry. How it's just better to wait on you to do it. It's better to wait for you to bring it forth. It's far better than Rick Warren's plan. It's far better than what Joel Osteen says. It is simply trusting you and waiting on you. Because God, you already have the day and the exact time of when you're going to do some awesome things. But we don't know that. And so God, give us patience. Give us hope. And Lord, this is where our faith gets tried. Is that teach us, God, that we can trust you. And not try to just do everything on our own to make it work out. Teach us, God, to let go and wait on you. Those lost people, Lord, you love them. You love them more than we do. And God, we ask you to save them. And we ask, God, that you save them. So that when it all comes down to it, you're the one that gets the glory. And not us. Father, thank you for the word you've given us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the good food that awaits us downstairs. Feed our bodies, give us rest, bring us back, and feed us some more in our souls. We ask your blessings on it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.